Hi, I'm Dr. Jason Skopp, and today we're going to talk about subchondral bone pathology. We all know that clinic is very busy, and on any given Wednesday, you might see a 33-year-old patient with knee pain, but this patient was unique in that she had a history of steroid use. She had extensive asthma. She thought she had a meniscus tear. When I got her MRI, this is what we saw. Second patient, a 42-year-old, was told he had a meniscus tear and is asking just for a quick cleanup so he doesn't have a lot of time off of work. And this is what his MRI showed. We have to think about the joint as an organ. As we ge begin to classify those two different MRIs and realize that there are two separate pathologies that presented with the same symptoms, we have to think about it in the framework of what the knee is. The joint is an organ. It's an interplay between the synovium and the joint fluid, the meniscus, the ligaments, the alignment, and most importantly, the subchondral bone. We have to be aware of that shark in the water, and that's what the subchondral bone pathology is. Surface treatments alone that don't address subchondral bone pathology are doomed to fail. And I think this picture demonstrates it best, which is sometimes when we're in the water, sharks see us, but we don't see them. And that is what subchondral bone pathology is. So etiology drives treatment. When I saw this first patient, I recommended a core decompression with an intraosseous bioplasty. The second patient I saw, I recommended a bio-uni with an eye balance high tibial osteotomy. Neither one of them were the quick cleanups that they wanted. What is joint preservation? When we think about managing the joint, we have to think in terms of what tools we have to do to manage that joint as an organ. Just like a lawn, where there is more than just the surface, so too is the cartilage layer. And we have to think from the surface all the way down to the subchondral bone. We have to organize our thoughts when we're beginning to think of the joint as an organ. For surface treatments, we'll consider using allograft biocartilage. As the lesions get bigger or may involve some superficial bone, cartiform works very well. For those focal lesions that involve subchondral bone, or even just a small focal lesion without subchondral bone pathology, a fresh pre-cut allograft or an oats autograft play very well. As the lesion gets bigger and there's more bony involvement, we need to consider using an osteochondral allograft, whether it's a bio-uni or a mega oats. But what about those lesions that really appear to have an intact surface but have large edema on the MRI? That's where subchondral bone pathology comes into play. When we began to think about managing these lesions, we really had to flip our understanding upside down and reverse engineer this problem. As joint preservation surgeons, we've always thought about the surface going down to the bone. Oftentimes, at the very beginning of the management algorithm that we've developed, we never even really consider the subchondral bone. Now we're going from the bone out. And if we ignore the subchondral bone, we know that our surface treatments will fail. And that brings me to the first concept that we need to learn today, which is the osteochondral unit. This is the interplay between the articular cartilage, the subchondral plate, and the trabecular bone. That unit, its job is to absorb and distribute the load across a joint. So when there is a failure of that osteochondral unit, we will begin to see failure of the joint as an organ and progressive breakdown of the homeostasis of the joint. When we begin to think about our treatment options, we need to consider the entire osteochondral unit. But what is the clinical significance of subchondral bone pathology, and really what in the world are we talking about? Are we talking about the same thing when we see a bone bruise after an ACL tear, when we see a degenerative bone lesion, or when we see avascular necrosis or osteonecrosis? I don't know, and I didn't know. I didn't know what I was talking about, and I didn't know what we were talking about when I first began investigating this. And when I realized, a lot of people don't know about this. When I spoke to my radiologist, he didn't know about this. So what I did was I sat down, studied, thought, and discussed this with many people, and began to get a better understanding of this subchondral bone pathology, and that's what I'm about to present to you. But when I was first beginning to investigate this, I felt like I was alone on an island. And when I would talk to other thought leaders, they felt like they were alone on an island. And then I realized what they thought was avascular necrosis might have been an insufficiency fracture. Or what they thought was a degenerative lesion might have been a, a traumatic lesion. So there was no bridge between the islands that we were all on. So collaboration leads to innovation. 
This is where the interplay between the scientists here at Arthrex, my technology consultant in the operating room, and myself were able to collaborate, look at the different options, and come up with an algorithm and a discussion. So let's understand the etiology of subchondral bone pathology before we understand the treatments. It's the pathologic interaction of subchondral bone and cartilage. So osteonecrosis, it's a very broad term. It is not a term that applies to every lesion. Osteonecrosis includes avascular necrosis. Osteonecrosis includes an insufficiency fracture. That's previously termed a sonk or a sponk. That is a term that we want to see transition away. Other bone marrow lesions are either caused by degenerative or traumatic bone bruises. And as we look at the MRIs below, that you can see that there are three different pathologies mirroring the descriptions above. So let's go into these definitions a little bit deeper. Osteonecrosis. This is the primary end result of an insufficiency fracture. How does that happen? Well, fluid will accumulate in the bone marrow. That leads to edema, which leads to focal ischemia, which ultimately leads to necrosis. There are predisposing factors to this. Meniscus pathology. Oftentimes on an MRI with these patients, we will see a posterior horn medial meniscus tear, and that increases the contact pressure, which sets the stage for the insufficiency fracture. These were previously thought as sonk or spontaneous osteonecrosis of the knee, but now we're calling them subchondral insufficiency fractures of the knee, transitioning away from the term sonk. What is the impact of intraosseous pressure? We have learned that in patients with knee pain, elevated intraosseous pressures are commonly observed. Intraosseous pressures in the femur with a bone marrow lesion is 97% greater than intraosseous pressure without a bone marrow lesion. Intraosseous pressures in the hip with bone marrow lesions is 55% greater than those without bone marrow lesions. So we see an increase in intraosseous pressure being demonstrated by a bone marrow lesion. Let's go back to osteonecrosis. What is secondary osteonecrosis? We learned that primary osteonecrosis has to do with an insufficiency fracture and the end result of that. Secondary osteonecrosis has to do with steroid use, sickle cell anemia, alcohol abuse, and sometimes post-arthroscopy. These are, tend to be in younger patients and often tend to be multifocal and can even be silent lesions. So to really put this definition and hammer the point home, I'd like to clarify with very simple sentences. When osteonecrosis is caused by a vascular insult, we call that avascular necrosis. That means avascular necrosis is a subset of osteonecrosis, but not all osteonecrosis is avascular necrosis. Let me explain. Avascular necrosis is a result of bone death from interrupted blood supply. That's when we go back to medical school and remember the concept of creeping substitution. The body is beginning to remove the bad or dead bone and replacing it with good bone. That is called resorption. If resorption occurs faster than bone growth, we will see collapse of that joint. That is why we see early stage and late stage avascular necrosis and we make the distinction between joint collapse and no joint collapse. When osteonecrosis is caused by a mechanical insult, it is called a subchondral insufficiency fracture of the knee, again, previously called sonk. An insufficiency fracture is a subchondral fracture in the weight-bearing area of the knee. It occurs by haversion and trabecular collapse, which leads to vascular disruption and then ultimately osteonecrosis. Now let's move on to different etiologies of bone bruise or bone marrow edema separate from osteonecrosis. It is very common to see a traumatic bone bruise, typically seen in an athletic individual or someone who twists their knee, presents with knee pain, no meniscus tear, and an MRI that shows bone marrow edema. We all know about the pivot shift, commonly seen with an ACL tear, and how that is, presents on an MRI. These are typically transient and resolve over time. Certainly the question about whether or not long-term chondral damage will develop is still left open. Subchondral bone pathology. In order to understand the treatment, we have to understand the biology because the etiology drives treatment. 
And that's where we get to this bone healing triad. When we think about how to get a bone to heal, it needs three requirements. We need a signal, we need a scaffold, and we need a cell. If we only have one part of that triad, our bone growth and our bone healing will fail. What are the prognostic indicators? When you're looking at that MRI in your office, what is gonna make something look like it can heal, or what is gonna be something that we know will go on to degenerative changes? Well, first let's look at lesion size. Lesions less than 3.5 centimeters squared tend to be more favorable. Lesions greater than five centimeters squared lead to and progress to osteoarthritis. How about the ratio of lesion size to condyle width? Because size is not an absolute. A lesion size in a small condyle in a ballerina may be different than a large condyle in a football player. So it's important also to consider the ratio of the lesion size to the condyle width. Less than 20% condyle width tend to be more favorable, but greater than 40% tend to progress to osteoarthritis. So when we think about the treatment considerations, really our intraosseous bioplasty is gonna be in the pre-collapse algorithm. Post-collapse, there are choices. I use osteochondral allograft plus or minus osteotomy as needed, or even arthroplasty. But pre-collapse is where we have the option for intervention. We wanna protect the weight bearing, we wanna unload the lesion, we can try bisphosphonates and aspirin, but we really need to consider the operative intervention to include core decompression and intraosseous bioplasty. Intraosseous bioplasty is defined as a core decompression with the addition of a biologic solution. Intraosseous bioplasty is the treatment of bone pathologies resulting from acute or chronic injury with techniques that encourage physiologic bone remodeling and repair to restore natural bone anatomy and function. Again, we still have to consider the etiology. We also have to consider our bone healing triad to include a cell, a signal, and a scaffold. Intraosseous bioplasty includes all three. Well, what's our technique? The technique is actually the easy part of the surgery. It's the decision, not the incision. We have cannulas that allow us to access the lesion. We can either go with a direct approach across the condyle or an indirect approach tangential to the lesion. We want to prepare our mixture for the IOBP technique. It's a mixture that includes DBM gel, and contrast may be utilized for visualization. There is a typical recipe that we've developed when mixing with the DBM gel, which allows easier flow into the lesion. In the knee, we use five cc's of DBM gel combined with three cc's of bone marrow concentrate. If you want to include one cc of contrast, we will use two cc's of bone marrow concentrate. In the talus, we use three cc's of DBM gel combined with three cc's of bone marrow concentrate, again, removing one cc as needed for contrast. After we've prepared our mixture, we want to deliver it. First, we do a core decompression. So the trocar is drilled into position, correlating with the lesion seen on the MRI. By removing the inner stylet, we are performing a core decompression with a diameter of 3.5 millimeters. This then allows us to deliver our biologic to the position of the bone marrow lesion. There are two types of delivery cannulas that you can use depending on your angle of access and the size of the lesion. There's an open tip and a closed tip. The open tip, as you see with the stylet removed, allows a direct injection of the biologic. The closed tip has side flutes that allow you to circumferentially access the lesion. Step one. We want to localize our lesion with a spinal needle. I typically have the MRI up on our image in the operating room, and I will, in my preoperative planning, understand in three planes where the focal part of that lesion is. I will look at the sagittal, the coronal, and the axial images, typically the T2 fat sat images. That gives me a three-dimensional understanding mentally where I need to localize it uh, when we're doing this live with fluoroscopy. Typically, you're not going to see the lesion when you're doing the surgery, so you really have to rely on your MRI for localization. I like to use an 18-gauge spinal needle. It is readily visible on our live fluoroscopy, and it does not cause a large breach of the cortex, which means we'll have less efflux of the fluid coming out of the cortex in a misfire. One option to use is an open-tip stylet by localizing the lesion first with a 
three millimeter guide pin. You're then able to pass the open tip delivery cannula over the guide pin. You can deliver our mixture. After the biologic is delivered, we replace the inner trocar. After waiting a couple minutes, I then re-arthroscope the knee to confirm that there is no drainage into the intraarticular environment. The closed end delivery trocar allows for percutaneous delivery. This is where you can do a direct drilling of the trocar to the lesion, as you can see in these pictures here. And here's a clinical case demonstrating the MRI and then the trocar before the biologic is delivered. This presentation has focused on the importance of managing and understanding subchondral bone pathology. We've introduced terms so that we can have an important dialogue and ensure that we are talking about the same thing when we're talking to each other. Understanding that an insufficiency fracture is not the same thing as avascular necrosis. So the treatments may be different and we have to understand what the natural history is of these pathologies before we offer a treatment. We've learned about the bone healing triad, the cell, the signal, and the scaffold, and how intraosseous bioplasty takes advantage of those three to treat the joint as an organ. In conclusion, intraosseous bioplasty offers us a biologic approach to treating subchondral bone pathology associated with insufficiency fractures, avascular necrosis, and early osteoarthritis. Thank you.